Hello, and welcome to our second lecture in Module 5 of this Cognition series online. We talked last time about uh, just a basic introduction to longer term forms of memory. In this a fairly brief lecture, we're going to talk about um, ways in which we encode information into episodic memory. In particular, we're going to talk about what's called the levels of processing effect. So first we'll start out by talking about uh, how depth or type of processing and encoding uh, might affect memory. We'll then get some memory lingo out of the way before we proceed. We have to talk a little bit about the different ways in which we talk about memory, test memory, that sort of thing. Um, we'll then talk a little bit about the ineffectiveness of maintenance rehearsal, and then we'll finish up with some evidence for the levels of processing effect. So let's start off by talking about what we really mean by depth of processing. This was first proposed to be an important memory mechanism by Craik and Lockhart in 1972. Uh, the basic idea is that encoding memory is a byproduct of the original operations that occur at encoding. And the quality of memory varies by how information was encoded. And of course, encoding is how we get information into memory. The idea here is that processing varies from relatively shallow and superficial to deeper, more meaning-based analyses. So shallow processing would be just glancing at something, um, looking at whether it's in upper or lower case letters, thinking about how it sounds, um, whereas more deeper meaning-based analysis would be, um, does this belong in a particular category? Does it fit into this sentence? Does it apply to myself? Is it useful for survival? These are different sort of deeper, or more meaning-based analyses that we're going to talk more about in our next lecture. The idea here is that um, the deeper you process something, the greater meaning-based processing you uh, engage in, this will lead to more durable, longer-lasting forms of memory. So the idea is that the way in which you process information is going to be particularly important for um, how you end up or whether or not you end up remembering a particular piece of information. So the implication here is that it's the way that we study or the way in which we process information, not how long or how often. So this is a different way of thinking about memory than many people are used to. So many people are taught that the best way to remember something is to repeat it to yourself over and over again, read it over and over again. But that's actually an ineffective study strategy. And we're going to look at how that is so um, here in just a little bit. Um, what's more important is how we are encoding information or how we're studying, not how often, how long, or um, how many times we repeatedly do something. So that gets us to talking a little bit about some different kinds of memory lingo. So the first thing we have to tackle is what we mean by incidental versus intentional learning. Um, and this is pretty straightforward. Um, an intentional learning task is when you sit down and intentionally try to learn something. So in a memory experiment, it will be you're going to get a list of words presented one at a time on this screen, try to remember them later for a, mem a later memory test, or I'm going to read them out loud and try to remember them later for a memory test. Incidental learning is where learning is incidental to a, sec a primary task, at least that's the idea. So incidental learning, we try to get people to not intentionally learn where learning is incidental to other things. So the way this works is you usually have some sort of cover task. Um, and we do all sorts of different things, things like um, syllable counting. Does this have more than two syllables or less than two syllables? Or more than three or more syllables or two or fewer syllables? Um, is it bigger than a bread box? Is it... Um, does it rhyme with this? Is it in upper or lowercase letters? Is it in red ink? Is it um, in a large font? Is it in a small font? Is it um, an animal? Is it a vegetable? Is it a mineral? Is it all these sorts of different kinds of tasks? So that you're not trying to learn them, you've got some other sort of task going on. So that we can see how those different kinds of ways of thinking about material will affect memory later. If we tell people that they're supposed to remember it later, they'll use their own strategy. So we have to sort of get them to think that they're doing something else. Our next bit is maintenance rehearsal. And maintenance rehearsal is something we've talked a little bit about already. This is basically repeating something over and over in the articulatory uh, process or in the um, 
phonological loop where you're just saying something to yourself over and over again. And this is a tried and unfortunately not particularly true method for um, trying to learn information. Sometimes it's all you have, um, but most often we can come up with a better strategy and we'll talk about those as we move through the term. Elaborate rehearsal is very different. Instead of just simply trying to maintain the information, we process the information in working memory. So rather than just spinning it around in that phonological loop over and over, we try to tie it to other things. We try to tie it to ways of uh, things that are important to us, uh, other information we already know. We try to tie things together. An orienting task is something we use in that sort of incidental learning task. Uh, where we direct the attention of a participant to one aspect of a stimulus in an incidental learning task. So it'll be things like upper or lowercase letters. Does it rhyme with? Does it fit into this category? Does it fit into this sentence? Does it apply to you? These are different types of orienting tasks and you'll get a chance to experience some of these in some of the online uh, tasks we'll do. <coughs> So finally, that gets us to shallow processing versus deep processing and shallow processing. Processing is based on maintenance, rehearsal, or sensory characteristics. So very simple, no meaning-based processing. Say something over and over to ourselves. We decide if it's in upper or lowercase letters. We decide if it rhymes with something. Versus deep processing, where we process by using elaborative or meaningful processes. What does it mean? Does it fit into the sentence or category? That kind of thing. So all of these things tie together to get us to how we study these kinds of uh, learning tasks. Before we move on though, I do want to do a quick demonstration. What I want you to do is to put um, things away so you can't see anything. In particular, your phone or your computer. Well, obviously you're looking at a screen now. Um, because what I want you to do is tell me which of these is the Apple logo. So sit and look at it for a minute. Is it A? Is it B? Is it C, D, E, F, G, or H? Without looking at your phone or some other version of the Apple logo that might be nearby. Well, in uh, an interesting study uh, Alan Castle and some of his students asked participants uh, a couple of different questions about the Apple logo. First they asked them how likely they were to be able to draw the logo from memory and very few participants were able to do that accurately although they were very confident in their ability to do so. They were also very confident in their ability to correctly identify which of these is the Apple logo. It's B for those of you who are wondering. Um, and once again, what uh, they found in this particular study is that participants were much more confident in their ability to identify the Apple logo in this particular lineup. Now, why did I ask you to do this particular task at this moment? If you think about the number of times you see the Apple logo every day, it probably numbers into the thousands, particularly any of you who have an iPhone or an Apple computer. Um, this logo is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. And if seeing something over and over again led to a strong form of memory, this should have been child's play. You should have been able to pick it out without even thinking about it. And some of you probably could. Um, but in my classes, generally it's about 60% of people can identify it correctly, which isn't very good um, if you think about how many Apple logos that we see every day. So what that tells us is that maintenance rehearsal is ineffective. That is, being repeatedly exposed to a stimulus is not particularly effective. And there are a number of other ways in which you can uh, demonstrate this. Memory for other logos, memory for things like, in what hand does the Statue of Liberty hold her, hand, her torch? What's on the back of the $20 bill? That sort of thing. But in this classic experiment, uh, Craig and Watson, Watkins sorry, um, looked at effects of maintenance rehearsal on memory performance. In this study, participants were told they would have to remember a word starting with a letter. Then they're presented with a list of words, and the task was then to hold on to one word. Uh, that word that started with, say, the letter P or R or whatever it was. 
So all they had to do was remember that one word and repeat it to themselves over and over again until the end of the list. And they actually, on some of the trials, uh, switched and another word came up that they were supposed to remember. So what they did is they manipulated the number of items that occurred after the target word and how um, rapidly they presented uh, those words. And what they found was, after a final recall test given after 27 lists, there was no effective rehearsal. That is, zero rehearsals were the same as rehearsal over 12 words and over different speeds. And so there was really no effect of different uh, amounts of rehearsal. And what we see then is that this is a particularly ineffective memory strategy. So the conclusion then is that rote or maintenance rehearsal is simply a poor memory strategy. And so we want to come up with a better way in which to try to get information into longer term memory. So that gets us to evidence for this idea of levels of processing. And this is a classic study by um, Fergus Craig and Endel Tolving. Uh, this is similar to the online levels of processing demonstration uh, my students uh, conducted. Uh, you can actually find several online versions of this if you're interested in doing it for those of you who are joining us from YouTube. <clears throat> the way in which Kirk and Tolving um, went about this particular experiment is they provided three different levels of encoding by using that kind of orienting task in an incidental learning ta paradigm which were structural, is it in upper or lowercase letters, acoustic, does it rhyme with this other word, and semantic, does it fit into a sentence, does it fit into a category, that sort of thing. So that orienting question directed participants to encode based on each level in that incidental learning task. And here's what they found. Very poor performance in shallow or visual um, encoding, slightly better in that auditory um, condition, but best performance in the meaning-based processing. And so um, we really get some pretty solid evidence that it is the way in which we process information that results uh, in um, better or lower memory performance. And so thinking about, rather than skimming over your notes, very shallow form of processing, versus stopping to really think about things, um, have a think about it. Think about how would I explain this to somebody else? How does this apply to my life? How would I rewrite this definition? What's a good example? Um, all of those are different ways in which you can try to figure out how to learn material in a deeper, more meaningful way. So just glancing over your notes is a pretty crummy strategy. Engaging in this kind of meaning-based processing is going to result in much better memory. And we're going to see this over and over again um, over the next couple of lectures. So we're going to leave it here. This is the basic levels of processing effect. Classic findings been found in dozens of studies. I've used this demonstration in um, dozens of classes. It never fails to get um, a result. It's one of these classic findings that works all the time. So we're going to talk a great deal about this, and in fact we'll see some other ways in which we can actually get even beyond just basic um, meaning process, meaning based processing into other kinds of processing, and that's even better. So we'll talk about that in our uh, coming lectures. <clears throat>